I want to recognize Commissioner Van Dieven for the job she did. She was one on the main panels that she discussed things that were going on in Missouri, how things were moving forward, how we were going to reopen schools here. So it was great to see her on center stage representing the state of Missouri uh, to other states across the nation. There was many doctors and medical experts in support of opening schools. And we are, as one of them said in the CDC, he said, we are not defenseless against the COVID-19. We know a lot more about that than we did back when it started, uh, how to defend ourselves from that and to get our kids back in the school safely. Even in schools, we can take steps to protect ourselves. I, I think one of the things, as I talk to some of the school administrators, the teachers, the students, I don't think there's any question in the state of Missouri, we've got to get the schools open back up. We've got to get kids back to school. There's a lot of things that occur by not having them in school that could be far worse than, than going there and fighting a virus that, that we know what's happening there. I'm confident the administrators in this state uh, that DESE can give the guidelines we need to get our kids back in there to be safe and start our education back up. We highly encourage Missouri schools to do whatever they can to reopen and get our students back in the classroom. And we know there are a lot of questions and concerns about what this will look like. Today, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and the Department of Health and Senior Services are releasing a document that clarifies questions and key topics regarding school reopening guidance. I want to thank these departments for their work on all of this and all of the medical experts across the state that also contributed. We are confident that if the schools implement this guidance, they can safely reopen this fall. Not only are we working with K through 12, learning back, get learning back on track, but also higher education and workforce development. Throughout this crisis, the Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development has been working hard to support both Missouri's college students and our workforce. With budget concerns and job layoffs and losses across the state, workforce, workforce development will be critical to our recovery, whether it be a four-year degree, a community college, a technical school, or other types of job training. This has always been a focus of my administration, and now, more than ever, it is critical that we have skilled, prepared workers to fill jobs and meet the needs of our economy. Today, we are excited to announce approximately $125 million in CARES Act funding for workforce development and higher education initiatives. Commissioner Mulligan is here to share more about these funds and how they will be used to support Missouri job seekers and college students. Commissioner Mulligan. Hey there, good afternoon. I'm Zora Mulligan. I'm the leader of the Missouri Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development. As Governor Parson indicated, since his first day on the job, he's made workforce development a top priority, whether it's an apprenticeship, a certificate, an associate degree, a bachelor's degree, graduate and professional or beyond. All of these have been highly prioritized by the governor in all of his decision making. And the announcements that he made today about the investments in these areas reflect his continued to commitment to that priority. So the governor gave you the big number. I'm going to give a little bit more information about how all of that adds up. Uh, there is $80 million of CARES Act funding allocated to public colleges and universities to help them reopen safely in the fall. Uh, I share the governor's belief that we can prepare for a successful fall and a conviction that it's vitally important for students to return to campus to have the experience both inside the classroom and beyond. They need to learn and grow uh, to contribute not only to our workforce but to themselves as individuals and to the lives of their families. That $80 million can be used for a variety of purposes. It's uh, very similar to the conversation we've been having since March. We know that we need PPE. We know that we need to modify our physical spaces. We know that we need uh, testing capability. We know that we need resources to comply with local health orders. So all of these kinds of things will be covered under this $80 million that's within the uh, CARES Act funding. 
There is an additional $10 million allocated from the CARES Act to public colleges and universities to help them expand their capacity in terms of remote learning. Um, one of the things we learned this spring is that it is possible for colleges and universities to very rapidly move all of their instruction online, uh, but that it is optimal to have a little bit more time and more resources to do so. And so this $10 million will give our colleges and universities an opportunity to address both short and long-term needs to make sure that students have um, access to the internet and also that institutions have the hard and software they need to do so successfully. There is an additional $23 million uh, that's allocated to the public colleges and universities from the GEAR Fund, the Go Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund. This will be used to ensure that colleges and universities have the faculty and staff they need to successfully serve students in the fall and beyond. And then in addition, uh, the governor mentioned job, job training. Uh, as we all know, we have a lot of uh, fellow Missourians around the state who continue to be unemployed. Many of them are going to be using this time to seek training and take advantage of the opportunities available to them. We've been working very hard since March to make sure that unemployed Missourians have access to this uh, opportunity, but we are substantially increased in our ability to meet those needs with money that's being announced today. And so that includes a total of $9.7 million for workforce training, $6.7 million of that money is for additional job training programs that people can access through their local job centers or by going online to jobs.mo.gov. That's jobs.mo.gov. Uh, and this helps people who are displaced from a job uh, access training. Many of those opportunities are available at colleges and universities around the state. Many, many of them are short term and all, available all online. So I really encourage people who are trying to think about their next step to consider that opportunity. There is an additional $2 million within that uh, bigger number I mentioned that to train Missourians for uh, high demand positions in information technology. And finally, $1 million just to provide additional support for the Fast Track Workforce Incentive Grant Program, which is a program that covers the full cost of tuition for an adult who goes back to school and pursues a high demand degree or certificate. So this is incredibly important. It's really, um, it's vital to our state's economic recovery. Uh, it also aligns very closely with work that we've been doing since March. So our colleges and universities around the state have been working very, very hard within their own communities to prepare for the safe reopen in the fall. They understand the importance of bringing people back to campus and really value the experiences that represents. We as a department are supporting that activity by leading a series of conversations with experts where they can get their most urgent questions answered and also developing a document that they can use to help plan for safely reopening in the fall. Uh, this also aligns with the long-term commitment of uh, getting more Missourians into the workforce and making sure those Missourians are uh, productive. And the best way to have a more productive worker is to have them be educated and trained. So I just want to express my thanks to Governor Parson and his team for this major investment in higher education and our citizens. I also want to thank my colleagues at the Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development. Administering this amount of money is not going to be an easy task, uh, but I know that we're up to the challenge and we're doing it because we believe it really matters. I also want to express thanks to the countless higher education uh, leaders around the state who've been working, as I said, around the clock since March to plan for these moments, and also to the hundreds of thousands of Missourians who are currently making the choice to return to school in the fall. Uh, in the higher education world, we have about 350,000 students who are currently enrolled, and I want to encourage every one of them to continue and persist. If they're thinking about taking a semester off or maybe taking a year off, I really, really encourage them to stick with their plan, even if their plan looks a little bit different than it did this time last year education changes lives and that's never been more true than it has been right now so again with thanks to governor parson and his team i uh, conclude my remarks thank you commissioner tomorrow we will be on the road for a few ceremonial bill signings in st louis kansas city and springfield on house bill 2064 which is licensed reciprocity and Senate Bill 600, which is the crime bill we just signed earlier this week. Director Dixon will be back with us to talk more about the economy and the recovery efforts being made in next week's brief this every week. But this is so important to remember as we continue to move forward with our recovery. I hope everyone has a good weekend, and I will see you next week. Before closing, I'd like to bring up a issue about an article that was written in the St. Louis Post Dispatch. And I think Kurt's here today that wrote this and it talked about uh, withholding funds of $300,000 for school safety in this state. I think the rest of the story should be told that that was part of a 1.4 million grant that we added 
last year to make sure that we were helping the security of the schools, which you'll notice that was never mentioned. So the reality of it was it's still a plus 1.1 million that was spent for school safety in, in our state. Second of all, as a former sheriff, when I was sheriff, I was one of the first sheriffs that put school resources officers in the schools at not a cost to the schools through my own agencies. As a grandparent, as a father, the one thing I do care about is I care about our safety of our children in our schools. I care about the safety of our kids on the street. And when biased articles are written like that, only to have an outcome just totally to be biased against the real issue, it's important that we get that word out to the public to know that uh, on that issue. So with that, I want to thank everybody for being here today. God bless. Dr. Williams is here today to answer some questions. So Kelly, let's go to questions. Um, on the $80 million that's going to help, uh, I guess, retrofit facilities, is that just for classrooms or could it be used at sporting venues or, or what? So it can be used uh, at a variety of facilities, basically anywhere that students, faculty, and staff congregate and bring guests onto campus is a, a potential use that institutions might choose to put this money to. Jack? Um, the Trump administration has decided to make international students leave the country if they plan on taking online only classes this fall. Do you have any concerns with that policy? I think that our colleges and universities are working hard to make sure that students have access to a variety of options, uh, including online and seated classes, and the same will be true for international students. But if, if, do you think that international students should be able to take online only classes? without leaving the country? Sure, so uh, this is a complicated issue and I know that it's one that institutions are working on addressing to make sure that students are served as effectively as possible. All right, Philip. Um, how do you plan to distribute the 80 million and also the 10 million for um, online learning? Is that going to be by grant or some kind of uh, system for dispersing equitably? Sure, so the coronavirus relief fund, this is nerdy inside state government stuff, but it has to be administered on a reimbursement basis. And so institutions will be required to demonstrate to us that they have spent the money on uh, permissible purposes and then we'll be able to reimburse them. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Dr. Williams. Thank you, Kelly. Let me just address a few things that may be on your mind. Uh, again, we're incredibly appreciative uh, that Missouri was picked to kind of highlight the opening of schools. You saw the governor of Missouri there with Margie on the panel, and uh, we very much feel and agree with the American Academy of Pediatrics that school is really important uh, for our children. And so uh, uh, a lot of people have worked very, very hard that Missouri can be in a position uh, that we are being highlighted and that we uh, have put out a plan working very closely with our colleagues at DESE. That is on their website. I think it goes up right now, so I would highly encourage you to go to DESE's website and look at that. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about that we're very uh, excited about is uh, in response, uh, the governor and I for the last four months have been on calls with leaders every week. We do about seven, I think, every week. Um, and they've expressed uh, an interest in our guidance on how to spend the, the CARES Act funding that they have to spend by December on COVID. And so uh, this afternoon, that goes up on our website, uh, www.health.mo.gov forward slash coronavirus. When you get on the website, go to the bottom where it's gray, and the very first thing you'll see is our um, CARES toolkit. It's very extensive, uh, it was really well done, and it goes in to give guidance to our mayors and our county commissioners and others, and working with our health departments, uh, our thoughts on how uh, a great way to use those funds would be. As you know, those went to the county commissioners. And again, it's very much the pillars that we've talked about. It's testing, and again, it's PPE, and it's contact tracing. And as the governor said, he uh, and I were talking earlier, he was my good friend Bob Redfield on Tuesday at the White House, and they talked. And so we're at a very different place now in Missouri than we were in April. But, but, um, I want to add, you noticed that over the last three days, our numbers are trending up, 700, 500, 700 today. So as we look at that, and we look at it very closely, because as the governor said, one of the capacities we have now is to use our own Missouri data to modeling. 
what we're seeing is this, and I'm, it's going to take a little bit of time to tell you this, but if you look at Missouri's experience to date of our tests, 60% are in five locations, St. Louis City, St. Louis County, St. Charles County, Jackson County, and Kansas City. If you look at the last three days, the, the preponderance, 50% of all of our increase is in those five, and then Jasper County gets thrown into that, and Boone has gone up a little too. So we're very much seeing that pattern that we saw before. And so when you talk to Spring Schmidt in St. Louis County, which had the highest number of those number of cases over the last three days, uh, what she'll tell you, I talked to her this afternoon, is, is what they're seeing is what we've been talking about is, is it's very much primarily young people, uh, not all, but uh, we're not, you're not seeing the mortality that we saw. We've done a great job of boxing in. Uh, with our long-term care facilities. Spring will tell you they're not seeing what they saw in April for the morbidity and mortality and the hospitalizations as much in St. Louis. Their r naught is almost at one now. But they are clearly seeing uh, a rise in young people who are catching COVID-19. Talked to Boone County, uh, Stephanie right before I came over here, and Scott. And uh, they are seeing situations where one person uh, congregating uh, often recreationally, uh, are infecting eight people. Um, and so uh, we're seeing that, and that explains the numbers you're seeing. It's, 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 it's community transmission of young people, uh, uh, getting six or seven people infected. And uh, while we're thankful that it's not our most vulnerable populations, uh, our senior citizens, we also believe that as that denominator increases, that it has a great potential to increase the numerator, the number of people who get seriously ill, the people who die. And so we are very concerned. Uh, so to all the young people out there, and if you will help me spread this message, uh, as, as we open up, uh, we are clearly seeing that uh, people are not practicing social distancing or using hand washing or using masks. And so we really need you to do that. Now, I've worn a mask for 30 years as a surgeon, so it's something I'm, I slept in masks before. But if you're going to be a young person, go out, wear a mask that you find appealing. Now, I, all of you know how much I love the Kansas City Chiefs because you've been looking at this tie for four months. That's the Kansas City Chiefs. So, again, you know, whether it's Mizzou or, or Missouri State or the Blues or the Royals or uh, the Chiefs, the Cardinals, uh, be creative, but we need you to wear a mask if you're not going to social distance. And we need you to social distance more than anything, and we need you to use good hand washing. So um, with that, I'll stop and be glad to answer any questions. Um, hey, Dr. Williams. Hey, looking, Sebastian. Looking at you from behind the camera. I see um, you there. You mentioned the, the toolkit that you put out earlier, and I had yeah. the chance to look at that uh, earlier this afternoon. Um, since the beginning of the pandemic, the, the state has put the bulk of the responsibility uh, in responding to, you know, outbreaks and managing uh, infections on local health departments, um, but those departments haven't been able to access money um, that the state distributed to counties because those counties don't have the infrastructure in place or are scared about spending it. And so you mentioned that toolkit. As far as I could tell, it didn't seem like there was much in that toolkit that was different from the FAQ that the treasurer put out a few weeks ago. Um, so how do you actually fix this problem beyond providing funding for one contractor for each health department? Yes, yeah, Sebastian, what, what we're hearing is you got to remember this money has to be spent by December, and it's a lot of money. It's $500 million. I know in one county it's, I think, equal to their whole budget for the whole year. And so what we've been hearing is, well, we just want to make sure that we spend this money correctly because we're worried if we don't, the federal government will ask it to, to give it back. And so we believe, and you've read the document this afternoon, how robust it is. I mean, it's very, very thorough. We hope this will open up their um, uh, willingness to share that money with local health departments, which are many times the, at the tip of the spear for COVID-19, uh, that we've now given them a blueprint. Yes, you can spend the money this way, and you saw how detailed it was. And if you have any questions, call this number and we'll verify that for you. So that's our strategy, that's our theory, that now that it's out there, we're into July, and you have to spend the money by December, that that will open up the dispensing of that funds to health departments to spend on testing, contact tracing, and PPE. 
just to get the message out there for county commissioners, if they want to hire contact tracers for their health department, the state says that's okay. That's yes. That's an acceptable use. Yes, okay. absolutely. Thank you for reaffirming that. Brian? Yes, Dr. Williams, good afternoon. Hey, Brian. Uh, good to see you. Uh, it looked to me, looking at the numbers today, like the COVID cases are up 795. So two questions. Right. One, is there an explanation for that in any particular region? And two, do you have anything new on the the revival, the church revival in Macon County where they had the COVID exposure. Yeah, Thank I'll you. take your second question first because you brought that up the other day and, and, and uh, uh, talked with my staff and then I called Mike the next morning, the local health director up there. And so we very much so. So basically there was a revival over about four days, uh, probably involved around 100 people, 150, came in from different counties. Uh, Mike is very much on top of it. Um, they're doing their testing and contact tracing, but he did say they need help with testing. Uh, the local hospital up there has been great. He very much appreciates, but they've been a little bit stretched. And so uh, very, very early this morning, I sent out a directive to my staff to make uh, uh, a contact with Mike and help him with the testing. And I think the way we're probably leaning on that is with our Abbott machines that we have, we can go up there and do point of care testing immediately. And I think that's the way that our staff was going. So I uh, appreciate you mentioning that the other day. I, I try to always follow up when you um, mention things. And, and just because I doesn't, don't know it doesn't mean my staff doesn't, but it always helps for me to hear it too. So I greatly appreciated that. And I think uh, they're in a good place and, and we'll be in a better place. Hey. Um, does the state have any plans in place for helping local health departments with contact tracing? We do. Um, I think if you will go, uh, um, as Sebastian was saying, if you'll read that today, you see that it is a hybrid model. It very much encourages the county commissioners to spend money on that, but it also sets up a regional and local initiative as well. And, and we think that's very, very important because an integral part of the testing is to follow up with the uh, contact tracing. We, the CDC left today, they had their checkout meeting. They, as I told you, they were gonna leave July 9th. And you know, that was one of the things that uh, they stressed was that it's just very, very important to follow up on that very quickly. They also, just for your edification, um, thought you know, messaging is really, really important to different communities uh, and to be very creative in that message, whether it's radio or social uh, uh, media, and so we're going to take those lessons to heart too. They were complimentary of our food processing plants, thought that they were doing uh, that which uh, they should do. And that's important because two days ago, the CDC put out a uh, MMWR report on all the food processing plants experience to date. And I would highly encourage you to read that based on, uh, I think it's 23 states, uh, uh, their experience to date on food processing plants. So it was just fortuitous that the CDC was here helping us with that when that report came out, but I would commend you to that. And if you can't get to it, just get in touch with Lisa and we, we'll get you a copy. So besides the, besides the guidance, there's not any like concrete things that the state is doing? Well, I think if you read the plan, there is uh, a, uh, a provision in there for each county to get one contact tracer and then to have a regional model and then to very much promote the uh, counties to spend that money for that very need. Hi, Dr. Williams. Hey, Connor. On the uh, positivity rate of yeah. just testing, are, is the state looking at doing anything of, or posting the data um, showing where it has been instead of just showing where it is right now like some other counties have been doing? Um, well, uh, again, with our positivity rate, um, I, I think we report by county our test. Um, we do it by region, uh, probably a little bit more so than county because some of the counties are so small. Um, so I will tell you by region, and we look at it every day, we actually look at it twice a day. As we look around at our positivity rate and also our r naught, uh, St. Louis right now is almost at one, uh, which is uh, in, in very encouraging, but we also have to have the back lay of that, that today they led in our new test. So if that persists, they won't be at one, it'll change the rate. St. Louis is at one, um, Kansas City was at about 1.2 as I remember. Uh, we're seeing uh, that trend. So our numbers, our, our aggregate numbers, our seven day rolling average numbers are holding our R naught, our positivity rate of 4%. Those are all holding. But uh, if you're gonna continue to have numbers of 700 and 500, 
uh, those will trend up, and we don't want that to happen. So, so we look at it very much by region. Uh, the governor and I were just talking. It's amazing to me, northwest and northeast Missouri run r naughts of 0.59. I mean, literally, um, you're just not seeing community transmission up there. But in the other regions we track, southwest, southeast, central, uh, and Kansas, we're over uh, one. And it, like I said, at St. Louis, we're holding right now at one. Hi, Dr. Williams. Hey, yes. Hi, so I know you said it's important for schools to reopen, but if trends continue in like hotspot areas and let's say in like Boone County into next month, yeah. do you think it's safe for schools to reopen if cases continue to spike? Well, we very much, you know, our, our mantra is we would much rather prepare and have to change course than not to prepare and then wish we, you know, and be in a situation where we go, gosh, I wish we had prepared for this because we could do it. Does that make sense? So we always prepare uh, uh, for a uh, eventuality. Uh, you know, the thing we know about children is, is that if, when you look at transmission to the best of our ability, and this was highlighted when the governor was in Washington and by the American Care Academy of Pediatrics, is that the transmission tends to be much more staff to children than children to staff. So as you read our guidelines on DESE today uh, on their website, you'll see that we're very, very much focused on uh, the, the teachers, the principals, uh, the adults, uh, and making sure that they are following uh, the best practices that we can possibly come up with. I think if, if we can do that, I think we'll be fine with the children. I really do. Uh, but again, it's an elaborate plan. And their recommendations, you know, we're under local control here, but many of the school systems, I've been on conference calls with, I think, a, I can't remember how many at a time, it was a bunch. Um, they very much are listening to what we have to say, and I hope this guidance will be very helpful to them. So I, I'm optimistic. I'm encouraged. And, and as we said, it's really important. I mean, uh, everybody we talk to, um, health experts, education experts, say that, that children being in school is really important for their growth and their education and their development. Yeah, Philip. Um, on hospitalizations, is there any effort to account for people who might be severely ill at home and are not going to hospital and also to make sure that they're getting the care they need? Well, unfortunately, when people get severely ill, they end up in the hospital. I mean, it, this is a disease that makes you feel really, really bad. Um, you can't breathe. And so in my experience, uh, it would be very difficult to have this disease at home and not. It's, it, it, it's not like chest pain where you might be able to endure it. You can't breathe. Um, I've seen enough cases uh, illustrated. So I don't think that's a big number. It's interesting. I was talking to a clinician today, and, and I want to highlight something the governor said that Bob Redfield said, which is we're in a different position. We know more than we did back in April. And I was talking to one of the doctors down in Cox that the governor I talked to every Saturday. He called me today, and um, they're really getting uh, uh, in, in, impressive results with uh, dexamethasone, remdesivir, and antibodies before people get on ventilators. And that's not something we were doing two months ago. We were waiting until people were on ventilators for five days. And then we were starting them on that. But uh, he was telling me today, and he sees patients every day, that uh, he's been impressed with how well those patients are doing. So that's also encouraging. And then on the autoimmune disease in children that seems yeah. to appear after a COVID infection, yeah. what more do we know about that, and how does that fit into the reopening plan for schools? Yeah, I, I listened uh, to the uh, website when the governor was up there, and, and again, that it still is a rare disease. It's like Kawasaki's disease, but it's really rare. Uh, when you look at the incidents at one time, I think I'd only seen like 130 cases in the United States, and there may have been some more then. But in, in my conversations with our pediatric in, infectious diseases here in, in Missouri, uh, they really emphasize that that is truly a rare disease, that... Um, we, um, while incredibly, uh, it, it has morbidity, there's no doubt about it, um, the vast majority of, of children in America are not going to um, have that issue, thank goodness. Dr. Williams, I have a question about masks. Yeah. We know that the governor said that he is not going to implement a face mask ordinance, but you just keep saying that young people aren't wearing masks. Do you disagree with the governor and think that these areas in the state should start implementing masks. We're seeing cities do it across the state. Are you glad that they're doing it? No, no. I mean, the governor, and I, I don't know how we could be any more consistent. I mean, I think we've done this like 80 times, and I think we say 
every week, uh, we say the same thing because we agree on it, um, is that if you're a young person and you're at a pool or you're in a bar and you've decided you want to be within two feet of people, you need to wear a mask. Okay? If you're at a, an event, uh, and that could be a concert, whatever, and you're within three feet of somebody, you need to wear a mask. I don't know how to be any more explicit on that. I think we have been. So no, we're in total lockstep on that. Now, we've also said very clearly that if a local county commissioner, a mayor, Mayor Lucas, Mayor Treese, uh, Sam Page, uh, Mayor Cruson, they feel, working with their local health departments and their community, that they want to add on uh, wearing a face mask, um, then uh, we certainly support that based on their local prevalence. But I want to get back to something. 60% of our cases in Missouri have been in five counties, okay? That leaves 109, as we counted, or 110, if you count St. Louis, in a very different situation than those five counties. I mean, that's 40% spread out among the other 69,000 square miles and 6.1 million people. So it, it's a diverse state, it's very different. Now, if you're in a very diverse part of the state and you're gonna be within two feet of people, like I was this morning getting my hair cut, wear a face mask. She, my, she wore one, I wore one, so. All right, thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank y'all. Governor Parson. Thank you. One thing I wanna to add to what Dr. Williams said, and I, and I think it's to be clear, because I know the reporter asked that about if there's, if you open school back up and all of a sudden you have the virus or a spike. That virus will be in the schools. I don't think there's any reason for us to think it's not going to be there. It'll be in the universities uh, as that happens. You just got to be prepared for it. And I, and I think it's important that the public knows that. I think it's important that parents know that. that the, and the schools are very well aware of that. That's why they're making precautions. But when school starts, somebody in there is going to have that virus. And it's going to be here until we find a vaccine or, or we find another uh, solution how to deal with it. But Right now, we know the situation, we know what that virus is, and we just gotta prepare for that when that day comes. Brian? Brian? Yes, good afternoon, Governor. Uh, Attorney General Barr announced last night that he is directing federal agents from the FBI, the Marshals, the DEA, and ATF to go to Kansas City. It sounds like more than 100 agents, part of Operation Legend. Do you have any more details on that that you can share with us? Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 let me just say this. Uh, I don't think any of us knew that was coming out last night, to be right honest about it. Uh, here in the state, but we had been talking for some time uh, about a strike force, about, about an agency to come into Kansas City. So uh, I think we all knew that was in the makings of happening. I, I just think for more than, we just didn't know it was gonna come out last night. But the reality of it is, uh, as I continue to move forward, as I said last week, we gotta address violent crime in this state. And I'm gonna do everything I'm power as I can as a governor, whether that's a special session, whether that's bringing in more uh, laws that we can get passed, put more troops on the ground, if I can do that, and to ha and help this area. Violent crime, whether it's in St. Louis, whether it's in Kansas City, whether it's in Springfield, wherever it might be, affects the entire state. And, uh, you know, we, we got to figure out how we put these law enforcement resources back to fighting violent crime. You know, right now, they're, they're just completely taxed out uh, as far as the workload that they're doing with everything else going on in these cities that they're trying to prevent and, and to protect. Um, look, the issue of violent crime, it's not going to go away if we don't go out there and do our part to attack violent crime. Hi, Governor. Um, thinking about kind of going back to the mask issue, the Texas governor said that he wasn't going to um, ever issue a mask order, but then we saw a week ago that he did after their surge of cases. Yeah. And so as we're seeing more cases here, is there a point that you would ever reconsider your stance? Not, not that I'm aware of at this point. L look, I, I think it's important. I, I've been pretty clear on this. When we open the state back up, I think that's exactly what we did. We opened the state back up. People are going to have to deal with the virus along with the economy, getting people back out there. Again, I, I'm going to go back to our kids, just some of the things I heard in D.C. and then that I know myself. You know, you got a lot of kids out here. If they're not going to school, they're in, they're in harm's way every day. We know that 60 percent of the calls on neglect and abuse are, are not there anymore, which means there's nobody to report it. So if those kids go to school, they're gonna have a relationship with their teachers, they're gonna have a relationship with their friends, and, and we're gonna be able to get back to protecting these kids. You got kids out there with disabilities that have no place to go, that virtual learning is maybe not an option. You got kids in poverty that maybe the best place in the world they can be and the safest place they can be is at school. 
and have a relationship with a teacher that they don't have at home, maybe with their own mom and dads. You know, that's all part of the education institution. And, and if we stop that, we stop the future. And, and I don't think there's any of us want to want to be able to do that. And uh, again, we got to figure out how we move forward. And, and that's what we're going to do. Um, so it's been, uh, I think, about two months since uh, your administration distributed the CARES Act fund, the $521 million to all the different county commissions. Um, a lot of health departments haven't been able to see a cent of that um, since that happened. Uh, why did you make the decision to put that money with county commissions who don't necessarily have experience distributing it rather than sending it directly to local health departments? Well, I, I think the county commissioners as well have got experience in how to spend money. That's what, that's what they do that every year. They all have budgets they have to work on. I think the one thing that uh, is a little frustrating for me as governor, the two things you know that you need to do, testing and contact tracing. So if there is a priority for the counties to realize if you're trying to search for some place to spend the money or what you're going to do with it, that's critical. You need to do that more than ever to help your own community. So I would encourage all county commissioners right now, take a look at your own school systems. Take a look how you can help on the local levels. That's what that money was out there. That's why we got it out the door so quick at an at unreal pace to get it on those local levels from to utilize that money to fight the virus. And, uh, you know, I encourage every county commissioner right now to, to step up and, and take care of the business. And part of that is testing and contact tracing. They can do that on their own. Uh, they can't sit around just wait for the state, every county to come in and, and take care of that problem. It's a problem for all of us, and we've got to work together to do that. So why do you think county commissioners haven't spent that money? You know, I, I, I don't know. You know, there's tons of county commissioners out there. We've talked to them. I think some of them maybe at first was trying to figure out what I can use the money for and different ideas they might have outside the box, inside the box. But I'm going to go back to the basic fundamentals that we know in this state we need. And if I was on the local county commissioner, I would be reaching out to my schools right now to say, how can I help to make sure our kids are safe in those communities? Because those county commissioners more, li county commissioners more likely have kids going to those schools. So... I think that and your community as a whole, how do you do that? Testing, contact tracing. All of those things need to be done. So they should be a priority. Okay. Hi, Governor. Um, I may have missed this earlier in the week, but Commissioner Mulligan mentioned today uh, $23 million in gear funding for colleges and universities. That's a, not quite half of the amount that was made available through that fund to the state. Uh, what's the rest of it going to be used for? Is that going to be K-12? Yeah, I'm not for sure. But look, look, every day we're trying to figure out how, you know, when we withheld the money, uh, we knew good and well that hopefully as money come available or guidelines change, we were going to try to backfill some of that money for K-12 through or higher ed. And I think this is what, what you've seen last week when uh, Desi was in here, what you're seeing this week in higher education. We kind of feel like that's going to continue on. There's going to be some more opportunities to try to make them whole as much as you can. Uh, and we're going to continue to do that. I'm not sure on the exact million dollars of who gets it when, uh, but, I, but I think the most important thing out of that is we're trying every day to make sure we take care of our education institutions in our state. Again, one of the priorities of this administration was education to make sure, one, that we were preparing kids for the workforce, and, and that hasn't changed any, and we now know that that's still the priority of this state, one of the priorities. So everything we can do to get education back up and running, we're going to do, but I want to give credit again to the school administrators, to the presidents of the universities and everything. You know what? We've been in contact with them early on to talk about the situation we're in. They all knew it. They've all took, uh, uh, you know, they took action ahead of time to make sure they could deal with it. So I appreciate them. I appreciate them understanding the situation they're in. And look, they've been through hard times before they'll get through this. Um, in terms of contact tracing, have you seen any gaps? Is there anything that you want, like, individual areas to work on? You, you mean as far as having do a better job on contact tracing or having more people there? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think one for your, for your health departments, for us at the state level, you know, I, th I think we can go out there and help through training sources, and I think Dr. Williams is doing that. That's a program I know we're starting to put in place that we can have training officers that would hear, like, hundreds of those to get them out uh, to help on those local levels, to train people how to be contact tracing and things like that. So I think that's important. And, and I'm going to tell you, that's going on at a fast pace behind the scenes because, again, I want that somewhat in place uh, before we open up schools. So you've got time to be able to do that. So I think we can do things like that from the state level. But, again, and then we can push these county commissioners and push the people who's got the money 
to start utilizing that money for contact tracing. You know, there's a lot of people out there that could do contact tracing with a little bit of training. Governor, I'm going to throw you a curveball. Off topic here. Yesterday, the president asked you if you thought about changing the name of St. Louis. Did that question shock you, and did you were you prepared for it? Well, I, I think he was. I, I want to say he was joking in nature when he said that. I think the reality of it is we're not changing the name of St. Louis. We're not changing the name of Kansas City in this state. Uh, and, and frankly, you know that 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 caught a little bit of a publicity because of the protests that were going on. But look. There is a lot more important things going on in this state right now than worrying about street names and whether you're naming a city, uh, what you might do. I mean, right now, people should be focused on what are we doing on this virus, everything we can do, what are we doing on the economy, and how are we keeping people safe? Uh, what's the violent crime situation? I, I think uh, we get off the beaten path, I guess I want to say, when we start talking about things like that. But, uh, you know, uh, I, I didn't know that was going to happen. So anyhow, but, but the point of it is, uh, I'm not going to lose much sleep over trying to figure out what the new name of St. Louis is going to be because I like St. Louis and I like the name of St. Louis and I'm proud of it. All right. All right. Thank, th 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 thanks, everybody, for being in today. Appreciate it.